And uh, it's my great uh, pleasure uh, uh, to introduce our, uh, introduc our, our introductory speaker, our welcome speaker, Professor Mark Yim, the Aza Whitney Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics. He's also the director of the GRASP Lab and uh, the uh, inspiration for much of what's uh, gone well in uh, the last uh, year uh, or so of the uh, GRASP undertaking. So, um, Folks, uh, because we have such little time between sessions, we're asking the prior speaker to just introduce the next speaker uh, turn by turn, uh, and uh, hopefully that'll um, keep us going. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, symposium. Thanks, thanks, Dan. So um, yeah, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this symposium on social implications of autonomous military systems. Uh, today, it, as Dan was saying, we're, we, it's kind of packed with a bunch of half hour talks from uh, experts um, on a, a really wide variety of areas, uh, you know, spanning robotics and automation, uh, history and sociology, law, philosophy and ethics. Um, you know, it's really rare that we have the opportunity for technologists uh, to interact with social scientists in a, in a kind of deeply way on, on shared issues. So that's this is part of the reason that I'm I'm really excited to to see what's uh, about to come. Um, but so this particular event is um, in response to this growing feeling in the robotics facility faculty um, that you know technology, especially robotics technologies, is advancing so quickly um, that often we don't have enough time to think about the social impacts of those technologies, um, especially when we think about robotics as a discipline. Um, but the other thing that we've noticed is it's not just, you know, the faculty that are thinking about this, but the younger generation, our students are also thinking about this. And occasionally we see, you know, grassroots efforts from uh, random people, um, coming up to us and talking about, you know, what's happening with robotics and how does it impact uh, society. Uh, so there, there have been a, a variety of efforts looking at the increasing pace of technology and, and how does it impact society, but there really hasn't been anything that addresses specifically military systems or autonomous military systems. So um, this is one of the reasons that basically it was Dan Kotacek and, and um, Professor Michael Horowitz uh, who got together and um, is essentially organizing this, this uh, whole event. So I want to want to thank them for for thinking about this and, and, and bringing this uh, to fruition. Um, part of what they did was got uh, two groups together, the, the uh, Grass Lab and Perry Worldhouse, um, who are sponsoring this event. Uh, so actually, I would like to take a couple minutes uh, just to introduce these two institutions. Um, so uh, I'm the director of the Grass Lab. Uh, the Grass Lab was founded 40 years ago, so it's uh, actually it's over 40 years ago. Uh, so it's it is also the world's oldest robotics research lab. Um, we've got about uh, 20 professors in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and computer science, um, and we all work together on a, a large variety of robotics. Robotics is actually very interdisciplinary, we include things like machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, flying swarms of robots, or, or floating robots, or robots that look like animals or people. Um, and then there's uh, machine vision, um, control, reasoning, design of mechanisms. All of these different things are, are things that we all work on. Um, and GRASP is one of the preeminent places in the world to do robotics research. Um, and we all work together, which is so great. Uh, the Perry World House is not 40 years old. It's a bit younger. Um, it was established about four years ago, um, and, but it's already making a, a really large impact. Um, the Perry World House focuses on some of the world's most pressing global policy challenges. Um, so it fosters international engagement um, on policy, uh, both within the Penn community and also outside. Um, and this symposium actually fits under one of the projects that they already have going, which is called the Emerging Technologies and Global Politics Project. Um, they, uh, they've already had a bunch of uh, uh, workshops and colloquia and, and uh, published papers on that and all that kind of stuff. And actually what I'd like to do is um, I, I want to encourage you to uh, look at their website and what I'd like to do is share uh, their website. And if you just, you know, if, if you search for Perry Worldhouse Emerging Technologies, 
um, you'll the first item will be the that particular website on emerging technologies global politics project. Um, and it, it, it's looking at things like how do the technologies such as artificial intelligence, cyber and robotics shape uh, global politics um, and includes this website includes all the events that they've had. And at the end, a lot of the publications. So you can, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but you can um, click and find all of the, the um, publications that they've had. I do want to highlight one. Um, I think this is the one. Uh, just as an example of the types of things that they've had. So uh, in this colloquium from a couple of years ago, um, they had uh, uh, John Kerry, um, who at the time you know, was the former uh, Secretary of State. And now he's uh, also within the current administration. Um, they, they had uh, uh, a president of a country. So uh, Rose, I don't know how to pronounce his name, from Kyrgyzstan, uh, as well as uh, Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. So you know, these are people, these are people who have actually had huge impact um, on the world and making policies, and ultimately that's that's uh, what they do and what we hope to do as well. I do want to also bring your attention to um, getting to the schedule for today, for what we're going to do today. If you look at, if you just search for Grasp Lab at the top, the first link is a link to this symposium. Um, and from here, you can see the schedule that we have. So uh, I'm doing the introduction. And then essentially, we've got sent close to half hour talks, a couple breaks. Uh, and then you can also see the abstracts for the talks that will follow. One of the things that I do want to highlight at the end, so it's a long day. And I know a lot of people don't necessarily want to you know, spend the full day on things. But one of the things I do want to encourage people to do, if, if you can come back, if you have to step away um, for the panel discussion at 4 o'clock, where we'll get everybody back together. Um, to, to kind of summarize what's happened during the day. And the, the last thing I want to do also is um, say a little bit more about uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it, what we want to get at the end. So um, at the end, what we're hoping is not just a day of, of education and reflection and all that kind of stuff, but it's also kind of a call to action. Uh, we will have a survey at the end of the day uh, and um, in that survey, we will want to invite people to also, uh, you know, volunteer for or, you know, list if you would like to participate in developing a uh, kind of guidelines for designers or advice to users um, of technology and robotic technology in this context that can have impact um, on, you know, global politics. Um, if the, hopefully we'll, this is just the beginning, we'll start to have um, workshops and other things. Ideally, we want to have follow-on efforts at uh, ICRA 2022, which will also be in Philadelphia. Um, but and as we develop, um, you know, working groups or, or that type of thing, we can start to develop uh, some type of document that can have impact on what nations do in terms of treaties and, and guidelines for uh, developers like technologists as well as um, users of, of uh, robotics technology. Um, so that's some of the things that we do uh, want you to think about. And hopefully, um, this is just the beginning of something much larger. So with that, um, what I'd like to do is um, hopefully uh, maybe get a jump on things. I know, you know, we've got a bunch of professors talking. And usually when you have professors talking, uh, they tend to take longer than they're a lot of time. So um, maybe we can get a jump on things slightly. And what I can do is um, introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Michael Horowitz, Professor Horowitz, um, uh, who is, you know, of course, as I mentioned, one of the sponsors of, of, of this event. Uh, he's also the director of the Perry World House. He's the um, uh, Richard Perry Professor um, uh, at U University of Pennsylvania. He's, he's world renowned for for doing, um, getting involved in uh, international politics, even on, especially on the things that we're talking about um, when, when it comes to technology. Uh, he's author of The Diffusion of Military po Power, 
Causes and Consequences of International Politics. Um, he co-authored Why Leaders Fight. He's won the, 200, uh, the 2017 Carl Deutsch Award um, given by the International Studies Association. Um, he, he widely published. Uh, he got his uh, PhD in government from Harvard uh, and his BA from political science at Emory. Um, he's worked for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's other things that, uh, of course, there's other things that I'm missing. Um, but um, with that, maybe if you would like to get started early, Michael. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the introduction, Mark. Uh, I really appreciate it, and and thanks to uh, and thanks to Dan for uh, for putting together this uh, this this meeting. I mean, you know, Dan uh, and uh, VJ uh, in part, and I have had uh, a number of conversations about you know some of these topics about the. You know, essentially military uses of robotics of autonomous systems, you know, going back, I, I think almost a decade at this point. And, and so it's really exciting to me to see, you know, this group here uh, together today to, uh, to talk about this issue. So let me, uh, um, let me go ahead and, uh, and share my screen here. The Oh, that didn't work well. Hold on one sec. All right, how's that? It's, uh, it's dark. Oh, there you go, Mark. That there, Mark. Right. So what uh, what I want to do today is give you all a bit, at least from my perspective, which it, I'll be clear is biased, and I will explain why uh, in a second. Uh, and, and an overview of sorts of what some of the debates have been like about the role of autonomy uh, in robotics and weapon systems, and what uh, international negotiations look like uh, today. And I want to start with, I think the equation that motivates uh, some of this, because this is an example of where I think uh, pop culture uh, actually plays a role in shaping our, the way that people think about this. And that, you know, if you take a robot and you give it a brain and you give it a gun, you know, what, what, what happens? You know, what happens in the Terminator? What happens in the Matrix? You know, what happens in... Uh, what happens in Battlestar Galactica, what happens in, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, what happens is the destruction of humans. And, you know, this is the, obviously the worst case fear and, you know, not, uh, not a super realistic one, but the, you know, this is a fear driven by, by popular culture in many ways, by which, you know, might say probably says more about how we think about ourselves than about anything else. But it animates, I think, a lot of the uh, discussions about uh, autonomous weapon systems. And I want to start with uh, sort of this question here about uh, who wants uh, AI and robotics. Um, and, and here I'm conflating obviously autonomous systems and artificial intelligence um, a bit uh, for reasons I can get into in the Q&A if people uh, want, in part because I think militaries are conflating them. And so from a policy perspective, the, the distinction isn't quite as, uh, isn't quite as meaningful as it, as it, as it should be. But you know, think about the different motivations here for why you would use uh, robotic systems or autonomous systems on the battlefield. If you're a democracy like the United States, then you're trying, you're, you're a, a wealthy country that invests a lot in your soldiers and is trying to reduce the risk to your soldiers uh, on the battlefield. And so for these kinds of militaries, you have an inherent uh, you have an inherent interest in some ways in substituting you know to use a phrase from economics in substituting capital for labor, and, and you know we've seen this already in this century with the development of with the uh, with the development of uninhabited systems of you know of the use of drones on the battlefield, and these investments are continuing I would say across the military waterfront by democracies you know by the United States but now think about if you're a, if you're say a, a democratic military in Europe. 
Maybe you have a little bit of trouble recruiting soldiers for your military right now, but you're trying to stay as a major military. For these kinds of militaries, the, there's a benefit to, to robotics and autonomous systems because they help substitute for the fact that you have trouble recruiting and retaining forces. Or say you're a democracy like Israel. You're a really small country, you know, surrounded by, uh, by much larger adversaries. For, uh, for smaller countries, I um, mean, in the autocratic uh, space, I put Singapore into this category. Again, the substitution of capital for labor can make a lot of sense. For more autocratic countries, you have a different kind of logic. Autocratic uh, militaries don't trust their people to begin with. If they trusted their people to begin with, they might not be autocracies. And for these kinds of militaries, they see uh, robotics and autonomous systems as a mechanism of control, whether through remote piloting uh, or, through, uh, or, or through algorithms that they feel like they understand, they think they can use autonomy uh, and robotics to reduce their reliance on humans that they view as sort of unreliable and potentially untrustworthy. Another frame that we have here is sort of ongoing international competition between the US and China, which I won't dwell on because I think it's actually not the most important part of this particular uh, of this particular sort of presentation or debate, but I think is worth thinking about a little bit in that that ongoing international competition is, is meaningful in that China has declared that it will be the world leader in robotics and AI by 2030. The US has obviously sort of been in the lead. And this is, this is competition that I think as academics we're aware of when we think of, if you think about the you know, discussions about immigration restrictions, discussions about visas, all of these like sort of kinds of issues, but spills over into the military realm as well, because for countries like China and Russia, uh, they view these areas as places where they could make breakthroughs that challenge American military superiority. Whether they're right or wrong is a different question, whether it's a good or bad idea is a different question, but that's an underlying frame that's driving a lot of investments by, uh, by China in particular, but also Russia uh, in, this, um, in this arena. There have been ongoing international negotiations to try to manage some of these issues that have occurred in a UN forum called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which is a huge mouthful and goes by the abbreviation CCW. Now, why it's CCW and not CCCW, totally unclear. Um, but they've had uh, the CCW entered into force in 1983. It focuses on weapons that are generally considered to be indiscriminate or problematic. Uh, the pictures here actually from when I gave a presentation at the CCW now, like almost seven years ago uh, on autonomous weapon systems. And you know, so an example of a kind of technology that the CCW discusses are something like landmines, uh, cluster munitions, uh, blinding lasers. And the, they've then, and as, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, have spent a lot of the last several years talking about uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems. And, uh, and, and in a minute, I'll tell you why and, uh, and, and how those have gone. But so what is then an autonomous weapon system? The, the definitional challenge here is not simply a legal issue. It's actually a fairly significant practical one. And so let me start with, here's how the US government currently defines an autonomous weapon system. The US government says that an autonomous weapon system is a system that once activated can select and engage targets without further intervention by a human operator. This is in uh, DOD policy 3000.09, which was originally promulgated in uh, 2012 and is still uh, on the books, although it could get, uh, it certainly could be uh, updated. And an important thing that I'll get back to in a minute when I talk about France's activity in this area is the distinction drawn in the policy between an autonomous weapon system and a semi-autonomous weapon system. And that distinction from a, a international negotiation perspective could become fairly meaningful in the coming years. Now, do autonomous weapon systems exist today? Good question. The answer is kind of, but not really. And so pictured here is the phalanx. This is a, it's an enormous Gatling gun, essentially, that has a, and it is normally operated by a human. So the human points, it, it protects ships from incoming missiles uh, or planes or military bases. And the way it works generally is there's an operator sitting there who points it 
at a target and fires. But what happens if there are so many targets coming in that you, a human couldn't track them? Well, it has an automatic mode. And in that automatic mode, there's an algorithm that selects and engages targets after activation. So in that way, this maybe constitutes an autonomous weapon system, but this is a, a defensive system that's existed since the 80s. You know, 30 or 40 countries actually have the phalanx or what was then the Soviet sort of now Russian equivalent of the phalanx. So nearly all of the systems that we would actually think about as an autonomous weapons system under that Department of Defense definition are, are sort of defensive systems that have, that have existed for a long time. You know, this is not the most cutting edge technology. All right. Why do people care about this though? Like, why is there so much concern? The concern is that autonomous weapon systems could move out of the realm of those kinds of defensive systems where there's a human on the loop to you know, broader systems that could be used for attacks. And you could imagine two different types of objections or concerns. The first are sort of ethical and moral issues. Uh, concerns that uh, essentially from a human dignity perspective, it's humans that should be making the choice about whether somebody lives or dies, not machines. And we can get into in Q&A, and I'm sure some of the other presentations, well, the extent to which this is true or not true in a, in a world of, uh, of more autonomous weapon systems. But there's a, there, there's a you know, sort of a human dignity or morality concern here. There are also practical concerns. Suppose an autonomous weapon system malfunctions. Suppose there's an accident. Who's responsible for that? How do you hold people or governments accountable when it's, uh, when it's potentially a machine rather than a person using military force? What do accidents look like with these kinds of systems? What do safety regulations look like with these kinds of systems? There are all sorts of questions that, that in some ways get to, get to issues of effectiveness. And one thing that I think is sometimes missing from this conversation is why militaries might be interested in these systems in the first place. You know, going back to what I said before, obviously the uh, militaries around the world have reasons to be interested in robotics and, and autonomous systems potentially, but first and foremost, it's, it's critical to keep in mind that militaries want their weapon systems to work and have a variety of different ways to use military force, again, for better or worse, whether one likes that or not. So, these systems are, are most likely to actually be implemented, you know, to be, to be developed, procured, adopted when they're seen as superior. And by that, I mean very particularly more effective than weapon systems that exist uh, today. So why not just get rid of these? Well, there's an NGO group that thinks that in fact that should happen. The Campaign to Stop Killer Robots is an NGO umbrella organization that includes a number of different uh, non-governmental sort of groups like Human Rights Watch, uh, like Amnesty International, a lot of different groups that were involved in leading the charge to ban landmines and ban uh, cluster munitions. And so they've been, uh, at, you know, they have branches in, in countries around the world and have made the case that because of these moral and ethical uh, and practical concerns, Governments should get together, you know, through that UN forum I mentioned before, and prohibit autonomous weapon systems, or you know what they call killer robots, before they get, uh, before they're, you know, implemented. To uh, there's too much sort of implementation of them. One interesting thing about this, from a sociology perspective, is if you look back at these groups and some of their early statements on these issues, which now date back almost ten years, the really what these groups were originally concerned about were drone strikes. And the, they felt like the cat was out of the bag with drone strikes, that there wasn't much they could do to stop that. And so their focus then became on what's next. And what was next from their perspective were autonomous drone strikes, drone strikes carried out by algorithm rather than with a human operator. And that's what they're, they're sort of, you know, that's a lot, that's like the use case in some ways that really animates a lot of these, uh, a lot of these discussions. So you've had international dialogue then over uh, in the CCW over the last eight or nine years. You have some countries that support a ban on autonomous weapon systems. Usually these are like smaller countries that don't have major militaries. 
but I wanna briefly go through what some key countries have said about this issue be, and then talk about this French approach for a minute, because I think that might be where the international, where international discussions go over the next year or two, although I could, I, I'm wrong all the time. China is probably the country investing the most in actual autonomous weapon systems. Um, the, but China's role in these negotiations has been very particular in that the NGO community was originally very focused on the US and Europe, that sort of campaign to stop killer robots I mentioned before. In about 2017, 2018, they started getting focused on what China was doing. And so China's response was actually then to come out in support of a ban uh, at the next UN meeting and sort of a way to deflect criticism, even though I think most people don't really think that the Chinese government means it, but also to define a ban in a very particular way. And that China, uh, China's definition of autonomous weapon systems actually looks a lot like the United Kingdom's. And that both define an autonomous weapon system is essentially something with like Terminator-like capabilities, as opposed to say like a really smart cruise missile or a, or a, you know a drone um, sort of acting uh, you know semi-autonomously. The UK, uh, just to skip to the bottom, there has a definition very similar to China's, but is not supporting a ban at this point. The U.S. and Russia, I, I, you know, I laid out the U.S. definition for you. The Russians basically are, are investing a lot in this issue, but, um, but, but kind of on the side. And this is actually an area where the U.S. and Russia have the same position, more or less, in an international negotiation. Although the Russians are fine to basically let the U.S. like say the words and take the heat from the international community rather than inviting a lot of NGO scrutiny. Where I think things could be going, you see in a French white paper that was released uh, just last month at the end of April. And that white paper lays out French concerns with autonomous weapon systems and essentially, but endorses with you know, some caveats, the development of use of what the French call partial autonomy. You can think about partial autonomy here as related to those semi-autonomous weapon systems that I mentioned before. Since I think a key question about this has been, all right, what happens if you, know, if you ban autonomous weapon systems and autonomous weapon systems include basically like anything where there's some sort of algorithm governing the way a weapon system behaves, what about smart munitions? You know, what about, what about ty different types of cruise missiles? You know, how, do you, how, do, how, do, how are those regulated? What about, um, what about using algorithms for part of the way a weapon system operates, even if the human is making the firing decision? How do you manage swarms? And the French approach essentially is to split the baby a little bit and take a, nearly all of the systems that any militaries are working on in research and development, which includes some of the things that I just mentioned, and call those partial autonomous systems and essentially in a way that's not as explicit as the UK, but is, is similar-ish to the UK, bracket off full autonomy is essentially something that nobody would ever do. But say they support regulating that thing that nobody would ever do. And one could imagine this as a, as a thing that more countries kind of get behind, even, in, even though it arguably elides some of the issues that, that people are really uh, concerned about. So uh, is this a case where we should have imagined international regulation is likely to be effective? Well, when do international agreements work? International agreements generally work when you have three conditions. One, you have demonstrated harm. A challenge in this case is that the, the, the harms here are, are pretty theoretical, which is make it, makes it difficult to mobilize public support. Second, is you need weapon, the weapon, whatever weapons you're regulating to actually not be that important for how militaries operate. Since if, if, these wep, if these systems are really important for the central features of how a military operates, if this is the new tank, or if this is how the new tank and new plane and new you know, submarine operate, it's a lot harder to regulate than if this is like a breaking glass in case, you know, like a weapon of mass destruction kind of situation. The third is you need clear scope conditions. What is being regulated and what's not being regulated? And this is where the lack of a stable definition of what constitutes an autonomous weapon system that the world can agree on creates a lot of challenges. An alternative is what I would call a confidence building approach. You can think about confidence building measures as government and non-governmental 
uh, activities designed to take advantage of areas of shared interest. Shared interest here is say involving accidents, promoting safety, reducing miscalculation. And this is a place where I think standard setting organizations, professional associations, you know, lots of, uh, lots of groups can play a fairly significant role in driving the agenda on how to talk about some of these issues in ways that promote sort of safer and more reliable uses of technology. And this is a tool that I think we're most familiar with from, uh, from the Cold War. So to wrap up uh, and then open up for questions, I think that there's some growing, there's obviously growing concern about lethal autonomous weapon systems, which you know, our conversation today is certainly emblematic of, even though they don't really exist yet. Like uh, a good example of this is that if you, every month or two, you'll see, in fact, like Dan and VJ and I were just emailing about one the other day, um, you know, you'll see an article in like a Wired or a Vox or something like that about like, essentially like, OMG, look at this experiment that's happening. Those tend to be, you know, a lot of you, especially, you know, over in engineering who do, who do work on, you know, who do sort of basic research work that involves governments know that it's those kinds of, it's sort of the next stage of the, that kind of research. It's, it's, a, it's applied research rather than things that are programs of record or things that militaries are buying. But that doesn't mean it might not, it doesn't mean it won't happen. But a lot of these experiments are a lot earlier than I think the public discourse would sometimes suggest that they, they actually are. So I think there's a little more hype than reality at present, but that doesn't mean, but th that in some ways makes it in a really important time to talk about these issues rather than to just sort of let things go and then you know, decide what to do later. At least in my opinion, I think if, if what you want is an enforceable international agreement, whether it's a regulation, whether it's a ban, whether it's something, clear definitions about what's included and excluded are essential. Alternatives do exist. You can have international agreements that don't have enforcement provisions, an example being the nuclear ban treaty. But the, you know, then, you're just, then you're trying to shape norms more than anything else. And finally, I think this French approach could potentially gain momentum over the next few years as countries sort of want to do something, but don't want to prevent themselves from taking advantage of sort of near-term advances in robotics and algorithms that could you know, enhance their, 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 their military capabilities. And with that, uh, let me uh, stop uh, screen sharing and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. If I could jump in and, and ask a quick question. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I'm afraid of, you know, um, the clear definition of what these, the countries, the stances are, um, would help. And my fear is that the, a lot of uh, policymakers just don't understand, you know, what the, the, the technology, I think you said something like the China ban defines these autonomous systems as more like Terminator than a cruise missile. Um, which, I mean, from our point of view, it's kind of, you know, a technologist, it's kind of obviously not the thing. Um, is there some way you can expand a little bit more about what, what, what specifically do they mean? Sure. I think that the, what I think if you look at the, the Chinese definition and the UK definition, they're talking about, they sort of set it up to describe, they're, they're queuing off of AI as much as anything else and sort of more like, like uh, artificial general intelligence kind of, uh, and thinking about algorithms that, that simulate you know, human, level per, you know, human level intelligence in decision making and saying like, that's bad, you know, like that, that we shouldn't do, but like other things are okay. I think the, one of the real, like, I actually think swarms are the real soft spot in some of these definitional questions. So suppose, suppose everybody agrees, all right, we want a human to make a decision, like a human should clearly make a decision about killing somebody, right? Like that's a, that is a really important thing. And so a human should be, a human should make that call. Well, when is the, like, what is the call? Is the call when you activate the system is the call, but like, what if you activate the system and then the system has like, is avoiding attacks on it as it's going to a target, you know, like, like where the call is, 
and then how that interacts with something like a swarm. Like if you activate the swarm, the human has made the decision, but each individual aspect of the way that a swarm operates, you know, a human isn't like deciding, obviously, or else like, what, like, what are we even doing? You know, what are we even talking about here? That's where I think it gets, it gets really complicated, frankly, and where the lack of technical knowledge on the part of, uh, of I think a lot of governments, um, and I'd say like even the NGO community uh, creates, um, creates challenges here in coming up with, with standards that I, I think that are realistic and, and, and that also take into account the way that many weapon systems today operate, like things like cruise missiles. Because nobody, nobody would want to go back to the world of like all dumb bombs because like we inadvertently like caught that kind of stuff up in, uh, in, a, you know, in, in regulations of, of autonomy. Susan, please go ahead. So Mike, you were a little bit, you said, oh, that's just norms. That's just modifying norms. Talk with me a little bit about what's behind that. So we know that for many weapon systems, um, changing norms are at least as important as formal bans or punishment for different parties. So I'd, I'd just be interested to hear your perspectives. So I think part of this depends on, so an example of where this, uh, so take the, um, take the Biological Weapons Convention. Mm -hmm. so the Biological Weapons Convention is a treaty from 1972 that the U.S. plays a leadership role in implementing. And the, the Biological Weapons Convention, Convention does not have enforcement provisions. And the question is like, why did we get the Biological Weapons Convention? Like one story is about popular revulsion against biological weapons, like, in, which I think exists, to be clear. Another story is that biological weapons are actually like not very good weapons. Um, and if you have nuclear weapons, you don't need biological weapons. And when the US is championing the Biological Weapons Convention, it had, you know, it had already decided under the Nixon administration to get rid of its biological weapons arsenal. So you have essentially the intersection of like both, you have a weapon that, uh, that the US no longer thinks is useful and where there's sort of moral revulsion against it. And in combination, that helps yield the Biological Weapons Convention. But the Soviets were not in the same place as the US at the time. And so thus the Soviets agreed to it, but ensured in the negotiations that there weren't enforcement provisions. The, the Chemical Weapons Convention in contrast, you know, which is finished in the 90s, the, the so, you know, Russia is particularly weak at that point. And so you end up with enforcement provisions in there. And I do think that norms, I, I think that norms can be effective, especially in the second generation at shaping what people view as appropriate and thus like where the Overton window is on what to use. But the, but I think, but norms take time to operate. You know, it's not like the, like policymakers sometimes I think talk about norms like, oh, we're gonna create a norm against X and like, then there's a norm. Like, like that's not how it works. <laughs> Like, you know, those are, these are generational processes about like with, about logics of appropriateness. And so if you, if you want to, and like the bet the nuclear ban treaty folks, or, you know, we had Beatrice Finn at Perry World House last year, you know, the bet that the, you know, who, who, who led that, the, the NGO movement to ban nuclear weapons, the bet the nuclear ban treaty folks are making is a generational one. They wanna shape the next generation of thinkers in the US, in the UK, in France in particular, and use those to delegitimize nuclear weapons with the hopes that maybe 20 years from now, maybe 30 years from now, it helps convince a country to get rid of nuclear weapons. Anyway, that's how I kind of think about this stuff in general, at least. Drew? I can you hear me. Yep. Uh, Michael, thanks for the talk today. I found it pretty interesting. Um, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Michigan working on agile autonomous flight for drone systems. So your talk is highly relevant towards a technology that I work on on a daily basis. Um, I'm curious, um, last week uh, we see in this conflict going on in the Middle East, um, what I believe to be one of the first instances of semi-autonomous drone systems, basically suicide drone systems being used against civilian targets. Um, I'm curious about the notion of, you know, when we talk about these international agreements, trying to prevent these types of weaponized drone systems from, you know, falling into the wrong hands or being used for, for the wrong use cases, 
I'm wondering how productive they actually are when your adversaries don't share the same ethical codes as you do. And, and does the floodgate start to open if the technology demonstration happens in underdeveloped countries with um, you know, semi-autonomous systems that really the technology floor is quite low to develop these things. I mean, I know in, in my lab, we could build that same thing in about a week. It really wouldn't be all that difficult to do. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. I think it's a really good question. I mean, something I didn't get into because there wasn't time is that, you know, if you think about a lot of the, you know, major military technologies of today, they were primarily, you know, the R&D, et cetera, was primarily funded by militaries. You know, today the R&D is, is, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot more going on in the private sector in some ways than in the, in the public sector. And when the, I mean, and empirically, we know that when the underlying basis of, of technological systems or, you know, when you have essentially profit, like market pressure and profit motive, I mean, that means that technological diffusion happens faster because there are lots of actors around the world with incentives to develop systems. I mean, and so if the question is, you know, how do you stop suicide drones? I think the answer is you're gonna to have to stop them the way that Israel tries to with defense. The stopping the technology, the cat's out of the bag from a technology perspective in that, you know, if what we're talking about is the, you know, if we're talking about like a DJI phantom with some explosives on it, like, or something like fancier, you know, like, or something like fancier uh, on it. I mean, the, the, that's going to be, that's going to be really hard to prevent someone from having the capacity to do, you need to convince them not to do it. Uh, similarly, I mean, you know, take a, you know, imagine you take a, like a small tracked vehicle and a, and you like go to Home Depot and you build a frame for it and you get a, like a, like a, um, some sort of like heat seeking sensor and you link it up with a gun. I mean, you could like that, none of that is fancy technology. You could, you, you could roll that into a public square in a city today. That would be an autonomous weapon system. It would also like clearly violate international humanity. I mean, that's a terrible weapon, but it's both not a good weapon and an illegal weapon. But the, the, I, think the, I think the question is like, essentially at the low end, I don't think you can stop proliferation. I think the question is at the higher end, can you, can you effectively regulate and can you shape what countries do in ways that, or if you think that technological development is inevitable, can you shape development in ways that that encourage countries to implement things more responsibly. I mean, that's one reason why I think, for example, the focus on uh, on safety and on sort of like safety and reliability and uh, in human control uh, could be potentially fruitful um, because it, it reflects the fact that given the basis by which a lot of these technologies are developed, they're going to be hard to control. Folks, I'm very sorry to stop this. Uh very interesting and, and profitable uh, exchange. We'll have more time to uh, get back to this very discussion, which is going to be, I think, central to much of the day. Uh, Mike, thank you for this um, really um, crucially valuable talk that um, we, we need to hear much more of your, these ideas. Uh, but I'll, we'll stop and we'll shift gears. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce Professor Susan Lindy. Uh, who um, is a known uh, expert. Uh, she just uh, put out a, a book uh, that I highly recommend all of us in robotics should be reading, uh, Moral Fog. She's the Janice and Julian Bears Professor of History and Sociology of Science. And, uh, you know, I've, I've not uh, talked with her, unfortunately, in the past, but I've developed a, a, in just this very brief time a, a conversation with her that I have found uh, extremely valuable. So, uh, Susan, we're very grateful to you uh, for joining us today, and um, I will uh, step back and uh, let you educate us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm glad to know that, that you think that it should be read by people engaged in these activities, because I do too, and part of my intended audience was experts. One of the, thing, one of the things that Drew's question made me sort of reflect on is how many times in the past, how many experts, scientists, engineers, physicians have struggled to reconcile their commitments to the production of knowledge for the good of mankind and their everyday commitments to aiding the security state. So their engagement with defense technologies. And it's not a simple story. I mean, I think even from Mike's comments, we see there are um, 
there are movements founded by scientists. And if we even think about these lethal autonomous weapon systems, there are massive efforts by AI scientists to prevent them or to somehow intervene in this process. So it's very important to pay attention to what it means to experts that so much science, technology, and medicine have been oriented around producing human injury. If we just look back over the last century, that's a big theme in my book. I'm going to talk today a little bit more narrowly about about um, um, I, kind of about the history of drones and the history of the idea that you could build, a, here's the, the theme, you could build a machine that would um, predict, it's a prediction machine. But before I switch to my PowerPoint, I'm gonna, I'm gonna indulge myself in recognizing two students who are of my students who are here today. One is Lauren Kahn and she took my course on science, technology and war a long time ago and I'm so happy to see her here. And also Britt Shields, um, who is my PhD student and uh, who is engaged with these issues herself. So um, I'm happy to see them both and I will share my screen if I can find it. Okay, here it is. And we'll go from the beginning. Okay, so I start. I mean, I want to bring up the question of seduction because I've been teaching this course a long time at Penn. And one of the things I realized after a while was that many of my students were fascinated by the beauty, the creativity, <clears throat> and also we'll call it like the physical intelligence, the human resources that goes into these gleaming military technologies. They, um, they pull us in. If scientists can find themselves mistrusted around questions of things like Darwinian evolution by natural selection or the efficacy and the power of vaccines or mm, global warming, on these systems, public trust in the United States is relatively high. These are trusted, admired, um, considered shall we say truthful signs of the power of scientific knowledge to produce something productive, effective that can intervene in the world. So when we think about these systems, what is this debate about killer robots or autonomous systems? You know, when Mike says there's a popular culture image, there's, there are movies, there are, there are uh, NGO movements. This debate has very deep origins in the fascination with um, machines with with the man machine boundary uh, we go back to the enlightenment and you can see concerns about what what is an automaton my my colleague Heidi Voskel has worked on this you know what does it mean that a machine can imitate the actions of a human and and even I'll say what it means to be human so I'm I introduced my comments with just attention to this almost this emotional element in the interpretation of these technologies maybe it's important to recognize them and to see that it will be, as Mike suggests, it will be important to think about how the public responds, what, how do these norms emerge and what makes something scary, what makes something seem um, unusable. Um, okay, so um, these kinds of weapons are not the first technologically sophisticated systems that were seen as threatening political and social order. And the best example is gunpowder. And I'll be a little bit simplistic about it. Um, oh, wait, I want to talk. Wait, I'm, I, I left out something. I want to talk about Norbert Wiener. So um, this is an amazing essay by Norbert Wiener in 1960 in science. And Norbert Wiener is, of course, the MIT cybernetician, absolutely brilliant creative person. And he, um, he said in this essay, and if, if we end up being able to share documents, I'll share this one with everyone. Um, he says, when a machine constructed by us can go faster than we can, we may not know until too late when to turn it off. And he says, so we may not be able to efficiently interfere. interfere we had better be quite sure that the purpose we put into the machine is the purpose which we really want, we really desire. And he says, we must always exert the full strength of our imagination to examine where these new, new modalities may lead us. So what he's suggesting is that we may not, um, we may not be able to um, predict to imagine properly what the results of any technologies will be. 
Now, um, remember too that earlier technological systems that seemed as though they would transform um, political and social order didn't always do so in the way predicted. Gunpowder had a huge impact on European powers, but the but driving it in a way and even driving some forms of the colonial order was the need for saltpeter. It was the need for for gunpowder itself, which required this natural material, which could only be acquired by conquering different kinds of lands. So how gunpowder is implicated in the rise of colonialism is it's implicated in two ways from both sides of the gun. Um, you need the gunpowder, but you can also use the gun to take over lands and so on. Some earlier technological systems were seen as likely to completely eradicate war. So for example, submarines as they were theorized in the 1850s and developed in the 1870s were believed to be so terrifying that war would be impossible because they'd be invisible under the sea, unreachable, um, unbeatable, and therefore this would end all war. Such a terrible technology would end all war. The same was true of dreadnoughts around 19 and these are the giant all big gunships that became very popular, led to a massive global arms race for about 20 years, a very expensive global arms race. And the dreadnought was supposed to stop warfare in general. I would add to this hot air balloons, which were dropping bombs from hot air balloons was banned in 1874 at Brussels because hot air balloons seemed like they made it possible. They opened a different location for um, uh, delivering a weapon and that, that needed to be banned. When we get to actual air power theorists in the 1930s, began to imagine that urban populations, if they were exposed, if they saw planes coming over their cities would instantly, immediately surrender. So when Wiener says we need to use all the strength of our imagination to examine where these will go, it's partly we can see that in the past when people imagine the future consequences of new technological systems, their imagination was often either incomplete, missing something important, or, or um, just not borne out by what actually happened when human beings come in contact with these technologies. There's one other comment I want to make, and it's about the idea that humans, um, that lethal autonomous weapon systems take humans out of the loop. And my comment about that is shaped by my, my own perspectives on um, how science and technology have participated in modern battlefield through the production of collateral data. So we know what collateral damage is, but collateral data is the production of scientific engineering and medical knowledge um, as a result of the chaos and the damage and the injury produced by war. And these collateral data can be used to figure out how to heal people, how to cure people. It can be knowledge to heal, but it can also, they can also be used to figure out how to produce larger and more effective uh, weapons. If you think about the strategic bombing surveys, those surveys were about figuring out which bombs were most effective and why, what kinds of materials were most dramatically damaged, when was fire bombing appropriate. But you can also look at things like Henry Beecher's work on the Italian front when he, in the Second World War, when he was given the soldiers who were expected to die, the most grievously injured, and he studied them for possible treatments of shock. And the point of that research was not to figure out how to put soldiers in shock, but to figure out how to treat it. Similarly, you might say that Robert J. Lifton's interview of, interviews of atomic bomb survivors was an example of an effort to develop psychological knowledge of trauma that could be useful for future groups that were traumatized. So um, when I think about military technologies, I never see humans as being out of the loop and I resist perspectives that disappear the people who are targeted. So humans are targets, they are laborers, they are their minds, the human mind is implicated in the ways that these machines are built. Um, I think we're unlikely to see or to understand them clearly if our imagination um, occludes the experiences of those who are expected to be killed. So we can be interested in this idea that humans are out of the loop, but they're not even close to out of the loop. This is a very, this is just a picture of a robotic mind detector. And it might be a story many of you know of a robotic teams that were built around these small mind detectors, which I guess are kind of cute and appealing in some way. Um, 
they would put flags on them and name them and eventually got so fond of them, they didn't want to send them into minefields. And so it became a problem. How do you get, how do you have people interact with these machines, which are kind of low AI? How do you get them to interact in a way that they don't become attached? Natural human reactions to these things. So I call them maddeningly human. All right, I'm going to do a quick survey of, of some kind of themes that we see in the history of these robots, um, autonomous technologies, artificial intelligence. And I'll start with the Russian-American engineer, Vladimir Zorkin. And he's interesting partly because what he did is to translate what he learned in the 1930s about Japanese suicide bombers. So there were news reports in the 30s that suicide camps were being developed in Japan to translate that into a different kind of technology technology. So as Warwick said in 1934, he said, we probably can't train American pilots to be suicide bombers, <clears throat> but maybe <clears throat> we can build a flying torpedo with an electric eye. So he's a television pioneer. He writes a memo to his supervisor at RCA, who's David Sarnoff. And the memo wasn't published in 1934, it was published later. But basically he says there's a technological fix for the unwillingness of US pilots to, to be suicide pilots. So you could have a radio controlled planes already in use, um, but they're blind beyond visual contact with operators. You could get the same, practically the same result with a radio controlled torpedo with an electric eye. The kamikaze pilot is eyes, vision, and television can make this possible. So this is not what was, nor this, is, this plan was not what was happening at the time in the 30s, the most important, um, we might call them, I guess, uh, automatic technologies were these radio controlled target drones. And these were heavily used in the Second World War. About 9,403 were built and shot down. The purpose of a target drone is to train someone on the ground to hit it. So it is, um, it is intended, you know, it's a training technology. It needs to be controlled. It needs to be able to do things that confound and confuse the people on the ground. That's important. Uh, there's a, a Norma Jean Doherty was discovered because she was working on one of these target drone assembly lines, and she turned into Marilyn Monroe. She was a 17 year old on the assembly line. So this is it's that's a very famous image from this period of building these target drones and um, and all the purposes they served in the Second World War. But the one I want to highlight is that they are about managing the minds of the people on the ground. So I'm trying to keep this thread of the mental state. Far more interesting in many different ways is Wiener's own anti-aircraft predictor. And everything I'm going to say here is drawn from Peter Gallison's really astonishing paper, The Ontology of the Enemy, that tracks how um, Wiener tried to figure out how to predict what an enemy pilot would do. What would the next movement of an enemy pilot be based on where what that pilot had done so far. So could you collect enough information tracking a plane across the sky in such that you could figure out how to meet it with uh, with fire within with aircraft fire. And so um, basically what Wiener did was to build, he had, he had two problems. He had to figure out how to build this machine. He also had to figure out the mind of the pilot. And so he built a, an, air, um, an aircraft simulator in his laboratory and he brought in pilots and, um, and they had to fly through flak. But what they, were not what they were not told is that there was a mechanical lag on the control stick. And what he was trying to do is to figure out how does the human mind respond under stress, under unexpected circumstances, when the flak gets worse, and what could a machine be built that could read this mind? Could you, could you do this? Now, of course, in 1947, Wiener, you know, coined the term cybernetics. It was based on a, a Greek term for steersman. And, and he was using it to describe 
more or less this sort of anti-aircraft predictor that would involve feedback. Um, it was game theory. It's nonlinear. It's a lot of information coming in. And meanwhile, and at the same time, the concerns in the 1940s and 1950s about other ways to use different kinds of drones included a new attention to surveillance that escalated, particularly after Gary Powers was shot down in 1960. He was tried for espionage, convicted in the Soviet Union. And it became very important to figure out ways to see the Soviet Union from the sky without a human being um, at risk. So essentially, the target drones that had been developed in the 30s and 40s began to be modified for surveillance purposes. They got larger, they could be controlled from the air, but basically this is a target drone being um, upgraded to handle reconnaissance. And, um, and, and meanwhile, there's a debate about, is it possible to, to have a drone that does more damage? So this is Robert Barkin in 1972. You know, he, he's, he's saying, um, this is an engineer, he's at the, uh, where is he? The Pacific Studies Institute. He's saying, um, it, the, the F-4 Phantom is, you're, you're spending $3 million and much of it is spent on increasing the probability that the human crew ret ret returns alive. So you, can you save money by doing this? This is not necessarily where we are today. As, as the PhD student Drew said, you can make these fairly quickly. You can make some forms of these autonomous weapons fairly quickly that are very dangerous. And, um, but this is an idea that this is a money-saving appeal. It's not just saving lives, it's, it's cheaper. Um, this is the arm, this, it's not particularly cheap. This is the arm, the arm predator drone today is a realization of many of these mixed visions. And I read that the 2031 edition of the predator drone, which you have to order now if you wanna get one, is gonna be about $32 million. So um, the, the, this is, you know, it began as Israelis modifying surveillance drones in the 1990s and then the covert CIA program. Um, outside of war zones, and this was the Bush administration, and then escalated in the Obama administration. Now, air war theory, as it developed in the night from the 1930s to the 1980s, um, imagined an enemy who could be controlled with um, attack on its basically production, its factories, its production facilities, you can bring down a country by destroying its capacity to produce material goods. This is not exactly a proper model for violent conflict today. It doesn't quite work anymore. And so I'm going to bring up some of the many new things are showing up now. And this is just Chris Demchak, cybersecurity, the democratization of predation. And what she means, she's using man-made, man-owned, man-maintained. I think she means human. Uh, man monitored. It all makes violence easier. Cyberspace is a conflict laden substrate. It's shared globally. It's across all these systems of any connected society. And, um, and what this means is that we live so much of our lives on this, uh, in this domain, that our vulnerability escalates because of that. And so if you think about how easy it would be for someone to track you alone at any time, um, if someone were interested, if you were one of the intimate targets of one of these activities, it's that we're all sort of we're living double lives, we're online, we're in real life, and those two things have fused. And this is part, she has, this is a wonderful essay on what this means and what this might mean for future warfare. One thing she proposes is that uh, you know, the Westphalian system that resolved the Thirty Years War in 1640 needs to be entirely updated because sovereignty doesn't look the way that it did anymore because of the cyber world. We can't imagine sovereignty the same ways that we did at times. So at the end of this paper, she also invokes all these in a kind of technologically determinism mode and a bit simplistic technological determinism, she invokes like the says cyber war joins the stirrup, the longbow, gunpowder, steam, the telegraph, radar, nukes to transform war. And we might question whether lethal autonomous weapon systems do the same. Do they extend this transformation? In some ways they do. The question of um, killing at a distance of um, 
the idea that more people are involved. It's, uh, it's not a single person making decisions. So responsibility is dispersed across large networks. Definitely true for all of these autonomous weapons systems. No one person is individually responsible. There's also the fact of this targeting of individuals in places that aren't necessarily battle zones. Uh, the whole world is your hunting ground in many of these, in much of this drone warfare. And so a lethal autonomous weapon uh, would intersect perfectly with the existing practices of, of global conflict. It's, uh, it's not, in some ways, it's not a revolution. It's not a transformative, um, um, you know, complete change, it's consistent with what's already happening. So uh, I have a couple of theoretical perspectives that I want to close with. And one is this is a beautiful paper by Law and Cologne from 1988 on the development of an aircraft system, where what they, they sort of say, um, Air, all these things are socio-technical scenarios, and they're socio-technical scenarios that include in the engineering imagination the social order. So they say engineers are not just people who sit in drawing offices and design machines. They are also willy-nilly social activists who design societies or social institution, institutions to fit those machines. Engineers were practical sociologists long before the discipline of sociology was invented. And they then they kind of conclude this paper and say a socio-technical scenario is a plausible proposal for a revised network of both social and technical roles that does not rest on a priori distinction between human beings and machines. Um, it's just a way of seeing what is happening and you know what exactly when you build a lethal autonomous weapons system what kind of a society are you imagining what is built into that technology itself what are the social rules involved and then finally this is from shamayu the theory of the drone where he says they commit the conflict zone to be located just inside the body the whole world becomes a hunting ground and and the 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 notion of armed conflict is a mobile place attached to the person of the enemy, um, not attached to terrain. And all the history of war is this land, you're taking land, you're taking space, you're taking castles. And, and now it's different. It's like a, a single body becomes the place. So um, I would suggest that lethal autonomous weapons system can resonate with the vision articulated by Wiener in 1960. Uh, he says, we can imagine machines operating at a pace we cannot match, and uh, we may not know until too late um, when to turn them off. Thank you. Susan, if no one else has a question, I'm, uh, I have 20 of them, but may, perhaps <laughs> I'll start uh, by asking, um, could you just expand a little bit on the sentences about whether you think this is new and very, very different, or whether you think we should be imagining the place of robots in particular, but lethal autonomous weapon systems more generally. Should we be thinking about these things as are, are very new? Or if not, where are the historical lessons uh, that we should be focusing on? No, it's a great question. And what I fear when I say that I'm expressing my fears, what I feel is that they're not what I'm afraid of, is that they're not all that new. That is that and it's kind of like the idea that we've been slowly getting, um, you know, maybe no weapon system is wholly autonomous, but um, more and greater distance has been achieved as a result of technological systems. And the idea that it's appropriate to have as much distance between the elite um, combatant and the, the intended target. In other words, that it's okay to have a battle where one party is in Arizona and the other is somewhere around the world that's already accepted. And so once you accept that, then you, you know, I mean, my vision of the, of an ideal, this is, 
kind of from Elaine Scary, she says, why don't we have a single combat warriors? If you're going to have a battle, why can't you resolve it just on the basis of a fight between two, I guess it's two men in this case, why can't you um, resolve international disputes that way? And in practice, you can't, because it, the results might not be accepted. But, but why is it considered acceptable already to have victims separated from their attackers by so many miles, by so much distance, and by so much difference in access to technology. So these, in no, talk about asymmetry, asymmetrical risk, should, you know, the one thing we might think about banning is something like asymmetrical risk. Um, if you're going to have a battlefield, it should, the, the risk maybe should be symmetrical. And, and maybe that would, in a way, make sense. That would change the way we conduct warfare. So I can't exactly answer your question. My comments are partly reflective of my fears that there's nothing particularly new about them and that that uh, that it that they fit right into the way we conduct warfare the way that violence works today and um they are scary but are they so dramatically different from a predator drone seeking out somebody in some isolated uh, location to to basically kill them separately Susan, thank you. Before we run out of time, I'd like to introduce uh, you to uh, uh, Dr. Fred Levy, who uh, we've invited in from the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Uh, Fred and I go back quite a distance now, and uh, I'm so grateful that he could come to join us. Fred, why don't you ask quickly, and we'll no doubt have to continue this in the panel discussion. Go ahead, Fred. Thanks so much. Hello, Susan. Uh, hello, Susan. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, my question is more on honesty from uh, the people developing the technologies. Uh, so, and, and doing the research, uh, what I've seen in, you know, I've only been in the government for about, you know, 13 years is, is that uh, there's, there's a lack of honesty and the capabilities of what can be developed, like what's being developed, what it can and cannot do. And what usually ends up happening from that is that things are paid for, they're made, they're overhyped on the media. And then when something fails, there's this huge, uh, you know, uh, chaos in the media. Example is kind of like the Tesla crashes, if you see in the commercial industry. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's oversold, but there, there's definitely a lack of uh, honest broking, uh, honest brokering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I don't know how to hold accountable the people developing the technologies. Like that, that's something that might, would make my job easier if there was a way of doing that, making people honest. You know, Fred, I think that would be a wonderful thing um, in general, but, uh, the, but many, um, I'll comment on your question rather than answer it. And that is, if we look at how, for example, the, the American Society of Microbiologists, so these are experts themselves, for many years, they accepted presidents and leadership who worked at Dietrich. They, it was not a problem if you worked on biological weapons. The physicists, there were many physicists. I mean, think about Teller. He never saw a bomb he didn't like. He loved them all. But there were other physicists who objected, who became part of a movement. And I would say Pugwash was the most successful to intervene and have an impact on the use of nuclear, on at least on nuclear weapons agreements. Um, so... It's true that in for all these systems, they're, they are they can be overhyped. They're promoted in order to suggest that this technology will solve everything. If we, you just have this weapon, uh, I don't know if you know Atomic Audit, if you've ever read that book, but it's an amazing study of all the bizarre nuclear, nuclear projects that were undertaken, many of which cost millions of dollars, many millions of dollars, and never came to fruition. So when I said that the public trusts these technologies, I didn't mean that they trusted them with good reason. I meant that these are war, um, admired, seductive, uh, beautiful technologies. And if you run into the average person, they, they may say, look at this incredible stuff we make. It's a sign of patriotism. It's a sign of how great the United States is. The actual history of these technologies is a mixed disaster and there's plenty of dishonesty. But, um, but I, I guess it that's- is my, It is my terrible duty to interrupt this really important discussion, hoping that we will come back and continue it at sure. the panel. And uh, meanwhile, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Claire Finkelstein, 
who I haven't, hadn't, again, hadn't met until uh, we began to organize this symposium. I know Claire and Vijay go back some distance. We'll introduce Vijay soon enough, but uh, Claire, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us. And I'm gonna get out of your way and uh, ask you to uh, educate us. Thank you. Well, I think I'd, I'd rather go on hearing uh, the previous three speakers because the, these have been absolutely uh, fascinating conversations and um, I look forward to being able to uh, talk all together, I think, at the end of the day. Um, my talk is a little bit of a shift in gears because I'm going to focus on the law of armed conflict and the relationship and the status of uh, autonomous weapon systems in relation to, uh, to LOAC. Um, but first, I want to start with a, an aspect um, of the law of armed conflict that actually has to do with the rationality of deterrent threats. And bear with me for a few moments because uh, you'll see eventually how the topic of autonomous weapon systems connects with this topic. So there is a classic problem in rational choice theory about follow through on deterrent threats. Ex ante, it seems to be rational to threaten to retaliate if another party engages in an unjustifiable strike against you. Among other things, the threat you issue will deter the other party from issuing the first strike. Once that first strike is actually issued, however, it will no longer be rational for you to respond because your threat, which was issued for the sole purpose of deterring the first strike, has now failed to deter. Thus, the benefit you sought from issuing the threat has now disappeared. And, and here I'm gonna share my screen just to show a few slides. Um, is that working? Let me see. Oh, share, there we go. Can you see my slide? My, yes, uh, Claire, yes. Good, okay, thank you. Um, so this is a profound problem in both rational choice theory and in the law of armed conflict. It is built into the nature um, of deterrent threats that from the standpoint of rational choice, deterrent threats are fundamentally illogical. By the time you actually make good on a deterrent threat, it is no longer rational to follow through. So this is roughly the structure of a normal deterrent threat in which at T1, you issue the threat, at T2, there was some triggering event, um, you know, say the North Koreans have unleashed their missiles that are making their way to California. Um, and you that prompts you to deliberate. Um, and now you have to decide whether or not to make good on your deterrent threats. Of course, the whole reason for issuing the deterrent threat was that you were hoping to deter the very event that you're now responding to. So now at T3, is it rational for you to follow through with your intended threat, your intended action. Um, in the area of, of nuclear weaponry, this is particularly problematic um, because, of course, there are issues like triggering nuclear winters where the, um, there is not only no gain to you from following through on the threat, but there is a cataclysmic addition uh, to the already cat cataclysmic um, events that are unfolding that you're responding to. Okay. Um, now, thinking about the relationship of autonomous weapons uh, to this, you can see that in one sense, there's an interesting advantage because from the standpoint of the human deliberator, this setup, the, the deterrence conundrum, if you will, um, is problematic because of what happens at T2. Namely, the deterrence is ineffective because at T2, we as human deliberators can see that it's no longer rational for us to respond. And knowing that in advance, knowing that in, in advance of T1, we can't, strictly speaking, in the theory of rationality, unless we can bluff, and we have reasons to rule out bluffing uh, in the theory of rationality, we can't make a credible threat. So, uh, you know, deterrence theory somehow overlooks all of this, um, but it has been a problem that philosophers, rational choice theorists, 
uh, you know, nuclear theorists and so on have discussed for uh, decades without any obvious solution. Autonomous weapon systems hold out the possibility of solving the problem of deterrent threats, because if stage two can be carried out autonomously, namely without additional deliberation, then it can be rational to issue the deterrent threat at T1, knowing that the follow through on such threats will not be subject to human reconsideration. So if we look at the logic of deterrence from the standpoint of laws, and I don't mean law of armed conflict, I mean lethal autonomous weapons systems, we can see that the problem of the T2 deliberation potentially goes away. Now, there's some irony in this, right? Because um, here we are, you know, concern, deeply concerned uh, about the use of autonomous technologies uh, to launch uh, lethal uh, force. Um, but yet, it looks as though, at least from one standpoint, there were great deterrent benefits to be gained. And those who are big fans of deterrence theory would say, you see, this has the possibility of actually reducing the risk from uh, nuclear weapons, because if you really believe in deterrence theory, then you believe that this will render our threats more effective and that triggering event will be less likely to occur. Now, what does this mean for the legal side? Well, the use of nuclear weapons is of profoundly, in my view, dubious legality under the law of armed conflict. Given the size and force of current nuclear capacity, it's very difficult to identify a plausible use of nuclear weapons drawn from, say, the current U.S. or Russian arsenals that would constitute a proportionate use of force. Namely, if you can get over the hurdle uh, of the question of whether or not there is a legitimate military purpose, let's start with that, so whether or not there is military necessity, uh, we are always going to have, and as we uh, had to profound degree in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the only actual uses of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict, um, a profound problem of proportionality. Indeed, in that instance, if you buy that the U.S. was launching nuclear weapons for the purpose of targeting a uh, military installation, uh, then, well, the problem of distinction is not presented, but the problem of proportionality is massive because the uh, human casualties and the um, destruction of civilian infrastructure cannot be justified by the military purpose at issue. Okay. Um, but now, if we, you know, depend on the, the human tendency to reconsider as a crucial step in the process to ensure that we do not escalate towards a nuclear confrontation, then from the standpoint of deterrent theory, it looks as though we actually increase the risk of the use of nuclear weapons potentially rather than reduce it. From, from the standpoint of those of us who are deeply concerned about the use of autonomous technologies and nuclear weapons, something seems to have gone wrong. Um, now, a different example um, has to do with the area of cyber attacks, so let me briefly talk about this. Enthusiasts of autonomous weapon systems um, are excited about the interface between cyber and, uh, and AWS. Uh, because of two factors. Number one, the increased possibility of, of response speed, um, and also uh, because of the issue of preemptive force. So if we become aware of a potential cyber attack uh, uh, that has unleashed, obviously time is of the essence. There is, is very likely the case, especially going into the future, uh, as these cyber weapons uh, develop that we will not be able to respond with the alacrity 
that is necessary to forestall a major cyber attack. Imagine a major cyber attack on our, on our energy infrastructure, for example, um, with potentially devastating consequences and enormous loss of life. The classic question in the law of armed conflict is whether or not it's permissible to use kinetic force to forestall uh, an attack that is merely cyber, uh, cyber-based, despite the fact that that cyber attack may have tertiary consequences that um, cause enormous loss of life. So once again, the laws enthusiasts or the AWS enthusiasts will say, well, this is exactly where autonomous weapon systems can play a role because uh, we can in effect design a system so that the only human interface is at the front end and the triggering event, namely the, the cyber attack uh, can be responded to, can be legitimately responded to with kinetic force, but that kinetic force is, as it were, planned in advance and doesn't require additional deliberation at T2, the point of the triggering event. So there's something of a paradox here, which is that from the standpoint of concerns about proportionality, and I should have said, of course, the objections to using kinetic force to address a launch of, um, of a cyber force um, is that it is disproportionate. Here, not disproportionate in the use in bellow sense, but disproportionate in the use ad bellum sense, namely that it's not appropriate under the laws of armed conflict to uh, respond to uh, cyber force with kinetic force, okay? or to try to forestall a cyber attack with kinetic force. And that, that's a problem that we have not you know, solved uh, from the standpoint of theory and the laws of armed conflict. Um, okay, so the irony here is that in some sense, the use of autonomous systems can actually get around problems of proportionality and other problems in the law of armed conflict. And the reason is uh, basically preemptive action, namely that you engage in your deliberations about what is proportionate from an ex ante standpoint, and you eliminate the uh, deliberation that occurs with the triggering event um, at T2, so that all of your deliberations, both about what it's rational to do and what it is lawful to do, occur in the ex ante mode. Should this make us enthusiasts about autonomous weapon systems? Uh, and the answer clearly has to be no, I believe. Uh, but the question is how to explain that. So um, as I'm sure many of you know, the uh, Department of Defense Directive 3000.09 makes very clear that when it comes to uh, the use of lethal force, um, the use of autonomous systems is unacceptable and there has to be a human interface uh, at the point T2 of uh, release of any kind of uh, lethal force. So um, it is among other things that directive says that it is DOD policy that autonomous and semi-autonomous weapon systems shall be designed to allow commanders and operators to exercise appropriate levels of human judgment over the use of force. There is a question about how to interpret this, um, but um, it is generally interpreted to mean force at the point of execution. Um, and moreover, that semi-autonomous weapon systems may be used to apply lethal or non-lethal kinetic or non-kinetic force. So you can use um, semi-autonomous systems with regard to launching lethal or non-lethal force. Um, but then the directive says, uh, interestingly, that even in the case of semi-autonomous weapon systems, um, that are integrated with unmanned 
platforms must be designed such that in the event of degraded or lost communications, the system does not autonomously select and engage individual targets or specific or, or specific target groups that have not been previously selected by an authorized human operator. Um, so there is a very clear you know, red line at the moment. Uh, with regard to the launching of uh, lethal force and kinetic force in general by uh, non-deliberative agents, if you will. And the question is, from the standpoint of both rationality and the standpoint of uh, uh, the law of armed conflict, whether or not that line will be maintained and whether or not it should be maintained. Uh, my own view is... is that it should be maintained, but we need better theories about exactly why. And uh, one way to think about it, of course, is uh, about human the level of, of uh, human versus machine fallibility. And a lot of the discussions have to do with fallibility in a way that I think confuses uh, the issue. Um, as we know from uh, autonomous uh, chess programs and, and other sorts of uh, semi-autonomous uh, or um, automated technologies, uh, there's an enormous debate about whether or not uh, fallibility is on the side of uh, human agents or fallibility weighs on the side of, of machines. Roboticists all seem to be, uh, you know, from at least the ones that I've encountered, and we've heard from many excellent ones at Perry Worldhouse and, and elsewhere, very much uh, on the side of human judgment uh, with regard to the trustworthiness and the skill levels and levels of expertise and so on. But I think as techno, you know, my concern is that hinging uh, the opposition to autonomous releases of lethal force uh, or even uh, non-lethal kinetic force on the fallibility issue um, puts us on very weak ground because as technology advances, that may be less and less the case. Uh, so it seems to me there's a more uh, profound issue that we need to confront, which has to do with commitment to our own humanity, commitment to the um, even if human beings turn out to be, in the long run, more fallible in certain respects, um, a profound and ineliminable uh, commitment to our own, um, our own humanity. And there's a story that I like to tell here, and I'm going to close on this and invite discussion. Uh, it's a story that appears in a book called The Mascot, which is a wonderful book about a little boy who um, is uh, in Ukraine, I believe, and uh, his family, he's Jewish, and his family is about to be murdered, and his mother tells him to run. And this is actually a, a true story, some of you may know it. Um, and he escapes his entire family, as it turns out, except for, for one member is, is killed, and he escapes through the woods. And he eventually comes on a... Um, a Ukrainian SS unit that is where the commander is lining up Jewish prisoners against a church wall and setting up a firing squad. Uh, and they grab the little boy and they add him to the firing squad. And he's about to be killed against the church wall when suddenly as the command to fire is about to be given, he reaches out his hand and asks for bread, just asks for a piece of bread because he's starving. And for some reason that leads the commander to direct uh, the firing squad to lower their guns. The commander grabs the little boy, takes him into the church, pulls down his pants and confirms that he's Jewish and then says to him, don't ever let anyone do that again. And he inducts the little boy into the SS unit where he actually lives out the war in safety. So this is the, the story of how he survived. So that moment of human decision, that moment where the commander has a 
an immediate gestalt shift where there's a kind of act of mercy based on an ability to perceive the humanness uh, of the person who's about to become his victim. Um, you know, I do not believe that there is any way that we will ever capture that in autonomous decision making and that the DOD line and our policy line and, and humanitarian law that draws a very hard line around the use of uh, the release of autonomous release of lethal force is exactly right. But philosophers and, and uh, legal theorists need to do their part to try to explain why this intuition is correct and why we need to hold it there because there's enormous pressure, uh, both from the standpoint of the effectiveness of our technology and the effectiveness of our, our national defense uh, to blur this line. And uh, I believe that maintaining the DOD policy is uh, over time not gonna be easy to do. Okay, can we invite questions, discussion? Good. Let me figure out how to unshare my screen. And I can't, I don't know if you can call on people because I can't right now see, see anybody. I don't see a hand raised. Oh, Mark has his hand raised. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, um, thanks for that. That was, uh, I, I was um, wondering about the, you know, the logic of deterrent threat. And what I, what I kept thinking is like, there's two potential ways to think about this. I don't know if we have time to, to go through this, but um, one way to think about this, um, uh, deterrent threat. If you if you say uh, you 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 know the decision, the deliberation, the human is removed from the deliberation. That T two, that middle event, is then given to an autonomous thing. Essentially, it has that deliberative event now moved to T one um, because you have essentially ceded the ability to change your mind. Um, that you know once this trigger, if the other person does the trigger, it automatically happens. Uh, then have you essentially given the other person, the, like if it's mutual destruction, you, you've essentially said, okay, um, if you do this, I will do that, and I'm not going to be in control anymore, so that's the threat. Uh, have you then given that power to the other person because you are no longer in control, it's now autonomous, or is it more like <laughs> if you're playing chicken, you know, where you're driving a car at another person, straight and then you somehow let the other guy know look i'm not touching the wheels in fact i'm not going to have any control of the car it's going to go straight i have no control and we will crash if you don't do something you know these are two different ways to think is, is it anything like that yeah i mean i think that's a, that's a very compelling way to think about it um that in effect the other the other side is triggering their own destruction right and so that's why in the theory of deterrence, this is very challenging because in the theory of deterrence, this you're supposed to be able to get perfect deterrence if you have perfect rationality, right? Um, so of course they're not gonna trigger their own destruction, right? But in effect, right, you know, going back to the North Korea example, if they believe um, that the, this, you know, perfect autonomous system is set up to bypass human deliberation. Um, you know, they understand that as soon as they launch those, you know, missiles, they will be destroying themselves. And so they're not going to do it. Now, <laughs> the, the theory of deterrence is profoundly flawed. But the argument is, well, this is one way we can, you know, we can get rid of one of the big flaws. Um, you know, for, for those who really work in, in the technology of this, um, the argument will very easily be, well, you know, there are so many mistakes, there are so many things that can go wrong. Um, you know, we know that um, there's no way that we can design a perfect system so that we can completely rely on the, um, uh, you know, the, the T2 autonomous triggering to occur at the right moments. Um, but again, I hate to pin the, um, I hate to rely on the fallibility argument as the only, uh, you know, quiver in our, um, in our 
in our bow to attack this because those, you know, time and time again, we've seen the technology rise to the level that we can eliminate increasingly those problems, or at least we can believe that we've eliminated those problems. Um, we love technology and, you know, we love to have a chance to, to use our technology. Um, indeed, you know, I think that's, it sounds awful to say, but I think that's at least part of why we decided to drop the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is we wanted to see if our technology worked, right? Um, and so I don't want to trust to the fallibility argument. I think we need to grapple with this at a deeper level um, to confront the, you know, the nature of human deliberation and why, why it's so important to us to have um, human deliberation in the process, even if it is, ends up being more fallible than uh, autonomous deliberation by a non-human thinker. <laughs> I think Jesse has his hand up. One hand. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Claire. Uh, thanks so much for for this talk. This is this is really interesting. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about um, as you were talking about T uh, two and and the triggering event um, is that presumably there there are going to be conditions that uh, you know necessary or sufficient conditions that have to be met um, you know in order to execute the threat. Um, and is the idea that the uh, that the autonomous system would be evaluating those conditions? Um, because if you allow humans to uh, deliberate over whether the conditions for the triggering event are met, um, then you know that's a form of deliberation uh, as as well. Um, and I just wondered, you know, if even in the foreseeable future, that uh, technology, th that there could be an algorithm that could, you know, um, identify the nuance in the real world. Yeah, that's a really uh, nice point that you make, especially because that's one area where uh, autonomous technology um, might be, in fact, extremely uh, beneficial in a benign way potentially benign way. That is the ability to monitor, monitor our environment and to give, to provide information um, and feedback um, to a human operator strikes me as a very different situation from actually making um, the triggering of lethal force dependent upon an autonomous non-human agent. Um, the trouble is that there are lots of studies that show that human beings are too snookered by technology, that they'll, you know, they will believe um, the deliverances of uh, technology even above, over and above their own eyes and ears. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this, but, but when I, <laughs> I'm very cautious when driving with a GPS system because I'll do whatever it tells me to do, even if I know it's wrong. So I will sometimes, you know, be careful not to put it on for routes that I know very well, because it will throw me off. You know, if it tells me to exit, you know, three exits before my exit, and I know that's wrong, you know, I'll sort of follow it blindly. And that, you know, this is a human tendency, psychological tendency. I've seen very interesting studies um, where they have a, you know, a robot telling people to do things that they absolutely know are completely false and insane and and people will be overly impressed whereas if they have a human being telling them to do that same thing they feel freer to ignore it so um using autonomous systems to provide feedback about the environment while i think it could be extremely useful it'll have to be uh deployed with a lot of caution Folks, thank you so much for the questions, Claire. Thank you for the terrific uh, talk. Uh, I have numbers of questions for you. I hope we'll have a chance to uh, engage uh, more in more in greater depth uh, in the panel discussion this afternoon at four. Meanwhile, uh, folks, uh, I note that the uh, uh, 15 minute break, the 1045 15 minute break is uh, at hand. I invite everyone to um, you know, uh, grab some tea, uh, take a bio break, whatever. Uh, and we will um, come back again at um, 1059.
where it will be my uh, honor to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Vijay Kumar, and we'll uh, continue our symposium. Thanks so much to uh, everyone who's uh, participated uh, and asked questions, and thanks so very much to the uh, speakers who've uh, already uh, educated me uh, tremendously uh, beyond what I had uh, anticipated. Um, okay, folks, we'll uh, we'll resume in 14 minutes. <laughs>